done in my political life at Kyoto, I worked night and day around the clock to find an agreement. I can tell you it was a close run thing. At three o'clock in the morning, on the final deal, the deal was about to collapse. It was this man, our Prime Minister, who rang President Clinton, who rang the Prime Minister of Japan, securing for the first time ever an international binding protocol on climate change. That's what we did. But hang on, there's a lot more. Not only did we lead the world on negotiating those Kyoto targets, but we are way ahead in meeting them. We're not only achieving the reduction of emissions by 12.5% now, not waiting until 2010, but we, have set, we are now likely to exceed it at doubling to 25%. Something no other country has done. We influence the international negotiations and we set the standards by implementing it ourselves. That was a major contribution of Britain in the early stages of climate change. But we have also done something else. And I'm proud to go round the world as ministers do themselves. And they look to Britain and they find we have done something that they warned us in 1997 that it couldn't be done. You could not have the cuts in greenhouse emissions and growth and employment. This country has shown you can meet Kyoto targets, you can have growth and high levels of employment. We expose that myth that they were incompatible. And I think now being readily recognized at last, even in America. But that was only made possible, only made possible by making difficult long-term decisions, controversial, much doubt about, but trusting your judgment and saying, this is right, we've got to go. You, can always, you cannot be certain about whether you're right or wrong. By God, over my life, I've been often wrong and I've been often right. But you have to make your decision. I think there's a powerful line in Tony's speech when he said, sometimes you can't make your mind. You have to trust your judgment. And that's what decision is about. It's certainly what leadership's about. And that's what this government's been giving in the last decade. But these, these are long-term decisions introducing the climate change levy. Now, I know that David Cameron did a photo call with the Huskies. The Tories now claim to be green. But we all know they oppose the climate change levy. That's the very policy that has achieved the huge reduction in Britain's emissions. That's the difference between making a decision. Conference, that is the difference between serious politics and clever marketing. Clever marketing. Not my words. Norman Tebbit. Did you ever think I'd agree with anything Norman Tebbit said? I said to my mate, Dennis Skinner, last night, and by the way, wasn't it great to see Dennis back in the conference yesterday? <laughs> Dennis reminded me that he dubbed Tebbit the polecat. And that was one of his more polite interpretations. And it was Tebbit who, during the Tory years of mass unemployment, told the unemployed to get on their bikes. I see David Cameron took that bit of advice anyway. <laughs> he got on his bike, except he's followed by the cow with a suit in the back. That's where, that may be called clever marketing. I call it Tory hypocrisy. You know, conference, if David Cameron thinks that a photo shoot of him hugging a husky and adopting an oak tree for their emblem can fool the British people into thinking that the Tories have fundamentally changed, then he's barking up the wrong tree. <laughs> and David, David, take my advice. Don't let the husky near the tree. <laughs> conference on Monday. Gordon spoke about the world's three great challenges, global challenges, terrorism and security, global economic competition, and climate change. Gordon, I believe there's another one, which is equally as important. It's people trafficking in the modern form of slavery, nothing less than a global scandal. <laughs> Cruel. 
wicked exploitation of men, women and, yes, children by international gangs of organised criminals, exploiting people desperate to escape the shackles of poverty, so desperate they'd do anything to flee the horrors of their homelands, especially in Africa. And as we approach the 200th anniversary of the abolition of slavery in British Empire, it beggars belief that people are still bought and sold like cattle. It cannot be right. It cannot be right that two centuries after the Hull MP will be William Wilberforce campaigned for abolition, when even 20,000 working class people in Manchester at that time signed a petition against this evil trade, that there should still exist in this world such an unforgivable horror of modern day slavery. Now we must recognise the special obligation we have to Africa the continent most scarred by that pernicious slave traffic. And if it cannot be right either that in this new millennium people are still dying in their millions from want, disease and particularly AIDS, and, sh and sh we should all be proud that Tony Blair set up the Africa Commission to raise the living standards in Africa, the world's poorest <laughs> continent. But we should be proud also of Gordon Brown's tireless work to end the scandal of nations forced to use their precious national income, not on providing medicine or schooling for their children or for clean water for their people, but to meet the interests of debts they could never, ever repay. As Nelson, as Nelson Mandela at this very conference told us that without Tony and Gordon working together, the world would not have sat up and take notice of the tragedy of a modern Africa. President Clinton confirmed that yesterday. That's what makes us an internationalist party, a movement that recognizes that solidarity does not end at our shores. That's the essence of our party. Conference. Let me say this, Tony, I'm proud what you and I have achieved together. We've had robust debates, as you know, and from time to time we've had to agree to disagree. But conference has never doubted this man's courage, his commitment and dedication to improving the lives of our people and safeguarding the interests of this country. That is the nature of Tony. He has given us an unprecedented period in office with three landslide victories and has achieved what no other Prime Minister has before him – economic prosperity and social justice within a decade. Millions of people are measurably better off than they were in 1997. Tony, we all know the greatest tribute we can make to your time in office is to find within ourselves the energy, the vision, the commitment and, yes, the self-discipline to win an historic fourth general election victory. Tony, Tony has told this conference this will be his last party conference as leader. This movement will be asked to elect a new leader after Tony has decided his timetable for leaving office. The way we conducted the 1992 and the 1994 leadership elections which I was involved in were a credit to this party and enhanced the very democratic process itself. But remember, this election is not simply a matter just for members of parliament. It is for the Labour Party, all of it, its constituency parties, affiliated organisations and trade unions in which millions are involved. This choice, this decision, this choice and this decision belongs to our members. Not one newspaper editor, one vote, but one member, one vote. Of course, of course we'll have the debate, but the debate must be within the framework of unity as it was in 1992 and 1994 when we achieved the orderly and stable transition. Conference, I know from my experience over four decades the damage that disunity can do 
I've seen Labour governments elected with big majorities, driven out within a few years by a party bitterly divided. In the 60s, failing to deal with economic realities. In the 70s, beset by inflation and rising unemployment, which led to the 18 years of Tory rule. 18 years that began and ended with the two longest and deepest recessions in this country we've ever seen, putting millions of our people on the dole. And at last, at last in the 1990s, we learned that painful lesson. For the past 12 years, we have remained disciplined enough to win three general elections, to establish the longest ever period of sustained economic growth with record jobs and investment in our public services. Indeed, a decade of delivery, not boom and bust. That would be the price of getting it wrong again. So it's up to us, each and every one of us, to make this orderly and peaceful transition. You know, I've had it said to me that a period of opposition would be good for us. I've even heard some of them say they'd prefer to lose a general election rather than see a particular candidate win. I tell this conference loud and clear that that is dangerous, foolish nonsense that we shouldn't tolerate. I'll tell you something else. It's usually expressed by individuals who would not feel the full savagery of a Tory government as it did in 1979. And it would be, and it would be a betrayal of millions of people who rely on a Labour government to improve their lives. I've spent 22 years as a Member of Parliament watching Tory governments wreck this country. And I can tell you from painful experience, there's no luxury of opposition. You know it. I know it. Disunity destroys. And this party would never, ever forgive anyone who undermined Labour in that way. <laughs> Conference. Conference. I've been absolutely privileged to attend this conference every year for over 40 years. I'm honoured to serve as Tony's Deputy Prime Minister. I'm just as honoured to serve as your Deputy Leader. I've always said I would inform you, the party first, about my intentions, not the press. And now I want to tell you that this will be my last conference as your Deputy Leader. Thank you for electing me and thank you for all the support over these last 12 years. So conference, so conference, in the coming debates about our future policies to meet the future challenges, let our political compass be that of traditional values in a modern setting. Let us find that consensus necessary to secure the future reforms and changes needed to guarantee a better Britain in the next decade. However, we do not have the luxury of three years before the next election. No, we only have seven months. Seven months. We are in that election period. Period. For the Scottish Parliament, for the Welsh Assembly, for the local authorities, involving more than 36 million people who will come to make a decision about Labour within the next seven months. Let that crystallise in our mind the political background in which we are to operate. We now, we now need to support those Labour candidates up and down the country. They do not want disunity. They do not want public personal attacks. They want our solidarity. They want our support in their campaigns. It is the duty of every one of us to give them our full backing. That's what I'll be doing. And I can assure you, Conference, I'll not be leaving the political fight. I'll never leave the political fight. I'll never give up campaigning for the Labour Party, as many as you do. Yes, admit, I'll be swapping me government jag for this bus pass to campaign for Labour. But nevertheless, whether it's a battle bus or a public bus, 
I'll be out there fighting for Labour. No doubt they'll be calling me to Bus Prescott. Believe it or not. <laughs> but remember, remember, remember who the real enemies are. The Tories, the Liberals and, yes, the Nationalists. So, as Tony said, let's get after them. Let's get after them all. So do it for me. Do it for Tony. Do it for your family. Do it for your neighbours.